It's Monday, December 5th, 2022. My name is Ashton Ellett, here with another installment of the Senate Staff Oral History Project, sponsored by the Richard B. Russell Library for Political Research and Studies at the University of Georgia. I'm here in McLean, Virginia, with General Arnold Panaro. A native of Macon, Georgia, General Panaro earned his Bachelor's of Science from Spring Hill College in Mobile, Alabama, and his MA in Communication and Journalism from the University of Georgia. He later earned a second master's degree in National Security Studies from Georgetown University. A retired U.S. Marine Corps Major General, he served on active duty as an infantry platoon commander in Vietnam, where he was awarded the Bronze Star and the Purple Heart. He later served as the director of the Marine Corps Reserve during the post-9-11 mobilization, Deputy Commanding General, Marine Corps Combat Development Command, and for three years as Commanding General of the 4th Marine Division. Other assignments included Operation Desert Shield, Operation Provide Promise, and Operation Enduring Freedom, as well as Operation Iraqi Freedom. From 1997 until 2010, General Panaro was Executive Vice President and General Manager of Washington Operations for Science Applications International Corporation. Since 2010, he has been founder and CEO of the Panaro Group, a Washington-based consulting firm providing counseling and business development, strategic planning, federal budget, market analysis, communications, crisis emergency management, government relations, and sensitive operations. He served on the adjunct faculty of the Walsh School of Foreign Service at Georgetown University, where he taught graduate, graduate level courses on national security decision making. The, today, uh, the topic of today's interview, however, will be General Pernaro's extensive work in the United States Senate. From 1973 to 1997, he worked for Senator Sam Nunn of Georgia, primarily in the areas of defense and intelligence. During that time, he served as Senator Nunn's Director of National Security Affairs, Staff Director of the Senate Armed Services Committee, and Staff Director from the Minority. General Panaro, thank you very much for, for having uh, Cheryl Vogt and, and me here at your office uh, in, in McLean, Virginia. Uh, looking forward to, to talking about uh, your time working with the Senator. Well, it's such a privilege to be here and particularly to be associated with anything to do with Senator Richard Russell, who remains one of the icons of the United States Senate and one of the most formidable supporters of a strong national security that Senator and I were privileged to inherit. Well, I wonder if we could begin. Uh, tell me a little bit about your childhood and your upbringing. Well, I was actually um, born in Augusta, Georgia, because my father, Angelo Panaro, uh, was the son of of Antonio and Rosa Panaro, who came over from Italy in the early 1900s, settled in Augusta. He was born in Augusta, but then he went to the Citadel, uh, served with Patton's Army in World War II, ended up meeting my mother in Macon, Georgia. Hmm. She grew up in Macon, because she worked at the Army Base Camp Wheeler, where my dad was uh, being trained to go overseas. Um, and we, I grew up in Macon, uh, even though I was born in Augusta, we moved right back as an infant. So I grew up in Macon, Georgia, which as you know is in the middle of the state, yes, uh, sir. a relatively uh, small town of about 60,000. Bibb County probably has a little bit over 100,000 people. We're kind of bracketed on both sides by Warner Robins and Atlanta. So Macon <laughs> has sort of stayed pretty, pretty, pretty static over the years. So whereabouts in Macon did you, did you grow up? Do you live downtown or something? We live downtown. My, my, as, as it turned out, my, my uh, mother's father, also came over from Italy. His name was Aristide Aurelio Benedetto. My mother's maiden name was Anina Benedetto. And um, he bought a house uh, in the early, mid 1900s um, that my mother was born in and grew up in. And as the only one of her family that stayed in Macon, she kept the house. And okay. uh, that's where my dad and mother lived and that's where uh, my my brothers and sisters, there were a total of seven in our family. We all grew up there. So uh, I ended up growing up in the same house uh, my mother grew up in, 854 Orange Terrace. It's right at the top of a hill, right above the big medical complex. And yeah. it was a great location because you could, and we didn't have people driving us around or Ubers <laughs> or taxis. So <laughs> I walked everywhere I had to go, but to get to St. Joseph's Church, which my church, it was only like four blocks away and St. Joseph's School was three and a half blocks away. I went to Mount Sales High School. It started at 815. I could leave my house at 
eight ten and be on time for you know homeroom <laughs> at eight fifteen because it was two blocks away. So it was a great location. So it sounds like you were raised in a, a fairly devout Catholic household. It was a it was a Catholic household. My mother um, had two brothers that were priests and two sisters that were nuns. So uh, they came from a, a fairly religious uh, upbringing. Uh, my father's family was also Catholic. And so, yeah, and so we were very tied uh, to the church, which was interesting in a, in a very conservative Southern town to have so many kind of Italian and mm -hmm. Irish Catholics uh, in that city. So what did your parents do for a living? Your, did your mother stay at home, your dad, dad worked? My dad or? was a small contractor. He, he had a degree in civil engineering mm -hmm. and um, he, he built light commercial and custom homes. My mother was a teacher. Mm -hmm. My mother taught home economics um, and she actually taught it in the, in the segregated black schools. She felt it was really important uh, for them to have a good education. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, during the time that, that I was still in high school, the, the schools at, high schools in Macon were integrated and she ended up teaching uh, at Mount Sales at the Catholic High School, but she spent many years teaching in the public schools. So did your, did your family, were they uh, active in politics? Did they follow politics at all? Not really. Um, that, that was not something that we paid a lot of attention to growing mm -hmm. up. And in all candor, um, you know, when I was in graduate school at the University of Georgia, when I came, got, got off of active duty in the Marine Corps after my service in Vietnam and on the staff of the Marine Corps Basic School at Quantico, um, my wife-to-be, Jan, had a great job working in Washington, so I was going to move back to Washington. I didn't have a job <laughs> and saw a flyer for an internship program for Senator Nunn for 10 weeks, so I said, what the heck, I'll apply for that and give me something <laughs> to do. So I'd never had any, I didn't even know Senator Nunn. I, I didn't even vote for him because I, you know, was out of the country probably when he, or something. But in any event, we, we really did not focus on politics growing up. Interesting. So you went to, you were telling me before we started the, the camera, you, you attended Spring Hill College, which right. most people, yeah, most people probably haven't heard of Spring Hill College, a small Jesuit school right. in Mobile, Alabama. So what, what, took, what took you there? Well, so basically one of my mother's brothers that was a Jesuit priest was named Arnold, Father Arnold Benedetto, Society of Jesus. I was named after him. And of course, I wanted to go to the University of Georgia when I graduated <laughs> from high school, like everybody else in my high school class. But my mother thought I'd, I would be partying too much, so she figured she better send me to Spring Hill where my uncle could watch over me. So that's what happened. That's how I ended up going there. Right. So you, you wound up being an English major, but that wasn't, re that wasn't what you started out as. No, I was going to go into pre-med, and that was another reason I picked Spring Hill. They had a great pre-med program, but once I started taking biology, botany, and chemistry, <laughs> I kind of figured out that was kind of too hard. So I switched to English. Um, and, you know, the years that I was going to Spring Hill was, was, was the Vietnam War was raging. Yeah. Uh, the year I graduated in 1968 was the peak year of the draft and everybody that I knew that went to college that year got drafted but Bill Clinton and Donald Trump. So, you know, it was a kind of a different atmosphere when we were going to school. So, were you active in ROTC or? I was or not. You that, were that would have been the furthest thing from my mind. I was, you know, basically into, you know, uh, minimal attendance at class and maximum attendance at the beach. I, I, th I think what, what you're doing here is dispelling a lot of misconceptions when people hear, I'm, this is an interview with General Arnold Panaro, that most people think you know, from gung ho for the, the, the word go. Um, so that wasn't you, were you drafted? Well, what happened was, um, so uh, you, the dra we, the, 1968 was the peak year of the draft. Right. And in Macon, Georgia, the lady that ran the draft board was named Mrs. Beasley. And my brother Anthony was two years older than I was, and when he was graduating from college, um, he wanted to get a deferment. And he went and met with Mrs. Beasley, and she said, nope, you're not getting a deferment. And he wrote her kind of a real nasty letter. I can imagine. Unfortunately, <laughs> when I went to see Mrs. Beasley to get a deferment, and she basically said, oh yeah, I know your family, I know your name. If I don't get you in June, I'll get you in July. So basically, I was gonna be drafted, so as it turned out, the, the Marine recruiter um, was, was on, and my dad, my dad who'd served with Patton's Army in World War II, and he was quite an accomplished uh, Army man, uh, graduate of the Citadel 1938, mm -hmm. said, you don't want to be drafted, you'll end up in the Army going to Vietnam. 
So I looked at the Navy and the Air Force, they were only looking for pilots. Mm. And basically to be a pilot, you had to commit for six years. You plus had to take a really hard test and I'm not sure I would have passed the test. <laughs> so the Marine recruiter, he was a major then named Jim Ray. I actually ran into him years later when he was a Colonel. Um, I was attracted, you know, cause he said, well, if you go in the Marine Corps, it's only two years. It's not, it's not six years, it's not four years. What he didn't tell me was, and you'll be a second lieutenant, you know, what he didn't tell me was it's two years if you flunk out of officer candidate school and you go to boot camp, it's only two years. So <laughs> I, I basically decided with a bunch of my buddies, we went out and had a few beers that night to decide and all went in the next morning and took the test. And he told me, he says, oh my goodness, uh, you've got one of the highest scores we've ever had on this test. I found my record years later when I was more senior. I didn't even pass the test. <laughs> um, but anyway, I signed up and um, ended up uh, going to Quantico and uh, thought I was a second lieutenant. And when I showed up and we're in this big hall and you know, all privates A through M on this side, all privates N through Z on this side. And, I go up to one of these mean looking drill sergeants with the Smokey the Bear hat on. I said, well, where do the second lieutenants go? And he said, you'll never be a second lieutenant candidate. So I, I, I actually, my drill, my, my recruiter really <laughs> pulled the wool over my eyes. And I did, I found him years later and gave him, read him the right act. <laughs> I, I guess we can laugh now. Yeah. <laughs> we can laugh now. But I mean, basically, uh, again, everybody I knew, uh, other than the handful of people that like, you were going to medical school, right? Um, you got deferred, but you had to go in the military after you finished your medical degree. Right. Uh, Sixty-eight was a peak year for the draft, and no, very few people got out of being drafted. And so I volunteered. So when did you find out you would be deployed to Vietnam? Well, so basically, we graduated in May. Our officer candidate school class started in November. That was a ten-week course. And, um, uh, you know, I, I've successfully completed that. Frankly, I don't think they watched very many people out. They needed second lieutenants pretty desperately in, in Vietnam. The average lifespan of a second lieutenant when I was there was five weeks. So I lasted five months, which was, I was a senior lieutenant in my battalion. After five after months. After five months. And so after the uh, OCS, we went to the basic school, which was a 21 week course and um, they were training everybody to be an infantry officer. So I, I kind of knew from day one that I'd be going to Vietnam. And sure enough, uh, when we graduate, we got, we started in February, we graduated in July. And because I had scored, uh, even though I don't know that I passed the entrance test, I scored very high on most of the tests at the basic school. And so they sent me to a five week course high intensity language training Vietnamese. And what they didn't take into account was somebody from the South with a Southern accent. Vietnamese is a tonal language. And you, the same word is said six different ways. It means six different things. Mm -hmm. And somebody from the South with a Southern accent is not gonna do well speaking Vietnamese. Sure enough, I didn't do that well, but it, I, I knew some basic Vietnamese which helped me. But I, went, I ended up getting to Vietnam in August of okay. 1969. And how long how long were you in country? Uh, I, I, I was uh, wounded on January fourth, nineteen seventy. So a little over five months. Mm. And you you were were you shipped back to the, the U.S. or or well, no, what the, base? The, the, um, um, at the time, um, my wounds were serious enough that I was medevac back to the Nang, and then I was airlifted to the Yokosuka Naval Hospital in Japan, where I was there for two and a half months. Oh wow! That yeah. But because you're, the Marine Corps is pretty rigid, your tour overseas was supposed to be 13 months. Okay. So I had only been uh, in country five months. I'd been in the hospital two and a half months. So I still had time left on my overseas tour. So they didn't send me back to the States. They sent me to Okinawa. Okay, so that, so that counted as your, your deployment. Yeah, and so I ended up from there going back to the Marine Corps Basic School at Quantico to train second lieutenants. Um, and because I had a, a really good combat record, that's the kind of people they wanted on the staff there. Right. So that was a really, and so I was there for two years. So I did my full four years that I was supposed to and then got out and went to graduate school at Georgia. So 
You, you went to University of Georgia and, and wound up in Grady College, so the Grady School Journalism? Well, because I had always uh, been interested in journalism. Okay. And uh, when I was at Spring Hill, I was the editor of the school newspaper and okay. wrote a lot of stories and everything. And so, and I worked on the Red and Black when I was there in the graduate school. And so I was very interested in journalism. And, you know, when I was getting ready to go, uh, out of the Marine Corps, you know, you had Columbia, you had Missouri, you had Northwestern, you had right. University of Georgia. Frankly, it's not clear to me I'd have gotten into any of those others, but the main reason I went to the University of Georgia is I couldn't afford anything other than in-state tuition. Right. So, you know, as a Georgia resident. Um, so you wanted to be uh, in newspapers or? Right. or mm -hmm. Yeah. So how do you go from being a, you're a second lieutenant, you're, you're, you're in the Marine Corps, now you're, you're a Georgia Bulldog studying newspapers and you end up on staff at, at, at so so again um, as I was finishing up my program at the University of Georgia Senator Nunn had an academic internship program it was not a political internship you weren't right. going to get it because you knew him politically right and I applied for it um, and had did some interviews and and was accepted and so when when they I went to, to this office 110 Russell um, they assigned me to the press section because they saw that I was a graduate of the Grady School. Roland McElroy, who was the press secretary, great man, a great Georgian, terrific press secretary, became Nunn's chief of staff, great writer. Of course, obviously, was attracted that I was a bulldog. Sure, sure. And I'd gone to the Grady School, so I became an intern in the press section. And after the 10 weeks I was there, they asked me to stay on as the assistant press secretary. Which I did, and and over the, and so something that was supposed to be ten weeks lasted twenty four years. <laughs> so what were what were your job responsibilities first as an intern and well, then as, as an intern, assistant? You were prim primarily doing administrative stuff, xeroxing, running letters around. Yeah. Plus, I basically worked in what was called Grant's tomb. So uh, there was a closet in, in, <laughs> in the thing that had been a restroom that they converted into a administrative area where they had the machine that called the Twix machine where you would send out the notices to all the Georgia counties of grants that they got. That's why we called it Grants Tomb. Thank you for clearing that up. We also, you know, being from the state of Georgia, you know, having a derogatory inclination towards the word grant was not, you know, unheard of as well. So we named the former bathroom Grants Tomb. So anytime like a county would get this big award, I'd send out a Twix notice from Senator Nunn, congratulations, you know, Bibb County, you just were awarded $150,000 for this, that, and the other thing. Mm -hmm. We also had, and this is no secret, the auto pin. So Senator Nunn would get over 5,000 letters a day, and he would basically personally approve every answer. So you would have stock answers that you know somebody wrote about the Panama Canal or something oh, yeah. he would approve the answer we put it on a machine and there's no way he could sign them so we had a machine that signed his name the auto pin right and you either signed Sam or Sam Nunn and I was quite proud of the fact that I, always, I held the record um, for signing the most Sams in one minute <laughs> on the auto pin <laughs> in fact one Halloween we used to the, the staff there we used to have a big Halloween party I took one of my tan military uniforms that we didn't use anymore in the Marine Corps. The Marine Corps changes its uniform all the time. So we had a tan shirt and a tan trouser that we weren't going to be using anymore. So I got fluorescent orange paint and used the auto pen and put Sam and Sam Nunn over the whole thing. And I went to the Halloween party as the auto pen. <laughs> do you still have that? <laughs> I do somewhere. I don't know where it is, but I know well, I have it somewhere. We'll have to preserve that. Right. That down at the <laughs> Russell Library. I'm not sure the Russell Library will want that. No, oh, I don't know about that. I don't know about that. <laughs> so, um, as Assistant Press Secretary, um, our friend Rogers Wade told me a story that you were the ca you were the cameraman. That's right. You you, ha you had a camera, and you 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 took photos at what it may have been Connell Stafford's wedding or or some so, wedding that you you so all were at. So basically, um, I was also a, a, a photography buff. Growing up and also in college, okay. took pictures, and so naturally, people that came to Senator Nunn's office wanted their picture taken with the senator. So I convinced them to buy a 
two and a quarter format camera. It was an old Rollerflex, great camera. And of course, you used film in those days. Mm -hmm. Now, the problem was a lot of times we didn't have the film, but that never stopped us when he would holler back for a picture. We'd go and <laughs> shoot a picture. And there was no film in the camera, and the constituents <laughs> for months would, where's my picture? So, Finally, we started using the Senate photographers to come over and do it because they were a lot more dependable. But I was such a good photographer. Gordon Giffen, who was done as mm -hmm. legislative assistant, but he got married to Patty. Um, I took their wedding pictures at Duke. I took the wedding photos of all my sisters, my wife's sisters. So not for profit, just basically sure. uh, to help people out. So yeah, Rogers is right. I did, I did. But Roland and I, it was a real gag. Because Roland or I would take the pictures, and lots of times we never had any film in the camera. <laughs> Just to give them a thumbs up and send them on their way. And, and it was years and years before Senator Dunn found out, and he was not happy. No, I him. can I can imagine. <laughs> But yeah, Roger said that you, you, you would also go over and take pictures for Senator Talmadge's office. and You were there so much, Senator Talmadge thought you were on his staff. That's right. The, one, the thing that, that <laughs> I remember about, of course, the Talmadge staff was great. Rod, T. Rogers Wade, Will Ball, Randy Knuckles. Of course, Randy ended up coming over. Right, right, right. So when my first son, Joe, was born, uh, first boy, um, I went to then Dark Drug, which was the kind of the cut rate drugstore <laughs> and bought those cigars, you know, with blue wrappings on and went to the office that day um, and was handing out cigars to everybody. And Senator Tamich was a cigar smoker. Oh, okay. so made sure Senator Tamich got one. That afternoon, you know, after I, you know, a couple hours after I dropped the cigar off, I get a call, Senator Tamich wants to see you. <laughs> and, and I'm thinking, oh, he wants to congratulate me about Joe. So I go in, it was in, so we were in uh, 110 Russell, Talmadge was in 109 Russell, just right across the, the hall. So you go in and then Talmadge of course had this big, huge office, his own office, and uh, everybody was in there. Will Ball, all the people, everybody, wall to wall. And Talmadge, I go in there thinking I'm gonna be congratulated and he has this dark drug. He said, well, oh, you must not be that proud of your son <laughs> to give me such a cheap cigar. <laughs> so uh, everybody had a great laugh. So what did I do is I walked right down the hall. The, the Army, Navy, Marine Corps liaison office was down there. And uh, John Campbell was an Army colonel. And I knew that he had some contraband uh, Cuban cigars that he that he brought for the senators to smoke on the Codells. So I went down and saw John and got a dip, dip, Diplomatico, a Cuban, a, a banned Cuban cigar. I took that back into Senator Talmadge and made up for it. That's, that's right. <laughs> that's a good story. But, that, but Talmadge and Dunn got along so well. I mean, that's, yeah. that was so important. And so what, one thing that I know Randy and others would point out when Matt Manningly unexpectedly beat Herman Talmadge and came to the Senate, Senator Nunn felt like, look, we represent the state of Georgia, the people of Georgia have spoken. We worked extremely well with Matt Manningly. He mm -hmm. was a good senator for Georgia. We, we liked working with Matt Manningly. He did a lot for our state. Now, he didn't get reelected. I think he got beat by Weiss Fowler That's know, right. when he ran back in 86. That's but right. Through the six years he was there, Matt and Senator Nunn and Matt got along well. And, Represented our state together. Well, it, Mac was on Milcon. He was on he was so, on appropriation. So yeah. at one point, at one point, did I tell this story too? When Russell was chairman of Armed Services, Carl Benson was chairman of the House Armed Services. So you had two Georgians mm -hmm. that ran the defense establishment in the Congress, and they would they the, the story was and Paul Moore tells this story. Our, our great uh, colleague Paul Moore. Um, you know, that Russell and Benson would say, look, we, we want to treat everybody equally, 50% for Georgia, 50% for the rest of the nation. <laughs> and so we tried to mirror image that. At one point, we had none on Senate Armed Services. Uh -huh. Jack Brinkley was from Columbus, was chair of Milcon on House Armed Services. Mac had uh, Milcon on Senate Appropriations, mm -hmm. and Bo Ginn from the 1st District had Milcon on House appropriation. So, if you look at our bases in Georgia and how well they are today, and the fact during the first five rack rounds, we never lost a base. Right. We pretty much took care of those bases and made sure they had modern facilities, 
and modern new missions. Right. And, and Mac would have been in the majority when he. That's correct. Right. So, That's yeah. Right. So from, from 80 to 86. Right. Senator Nunn was in the minority, Mac was in the majority, and, and, and again, did really good stuff for our state. But what happened was after I'd been in the press section for a couple of years, mm -hmm. because I was a, really the only one with combat experience on the staff, I started gravitating. Sir Nunn started moving me more over on the defense side, and he particularly wanted me to kind of uh, take over and figure out how to help the Georgia basis, which I did. So I gradually evolved from the press section into being sort of in the national security section. So is it, would that be national security section on personal staff or, or? So I spent 10 years on the personal staff. Okay. So none was, did not become the ranking member until 1983 when Scoop Jackson passed away. That's right. And That's so right. when he became the ranking member, he moved me over to the committee staff as the minority staff director. Three years later when the Senate flipped, he became the chairman, I became the staff director. Okay. But for, but for many, so I would say Starting in about 77, somewhere in that time frame, I started doing the military stuff. So what, you're talking about military bases. What other, what other military defense-related issues, budget? Um, oh, yeah. We, 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 I mean, you had Senator Nunn was chairman of the Mankind Personnel Subcommittee on the SAS. Okay. Senator Armed Services Committee. We had gone from the draft in, to the volunteer force in 1973, and it was really struggling. It was going under, and we had to save it. Mm -hmm. So we spent a lot of time in that personnel subcommittee working personnel issues. Uh, you had the, the, the Vietnam drawdown. Uh, we, we pulled the troops out in 73. The country fell in 75. Mm -hmm. um, Senator Nunn actually did a report called Vietnam Aid to Painful Options uh, that we worked on. And then we shifted to looking at NATO. NATO and the new Soviet threat was our first of our three NATO reports. Um, but he was, we were very active in, in, in not just Georgia parochial issues, but big defense issues. Obviously, Carter got elected as president, and it was, you know, Senator Nunn was concerned that we weren't spending enough on defense, so we worked on the Carter administration to increase the level of spending for defense, which happened. Um, he also had a couple of political appointees, like Paul Warnke, who he wanted to be uh, the head of the arms control um, uh, agency, but also the, the SALT, the, the Strategic Arms Limitation Talks negotiator. Sir Nunn was not in favor of that because he thought Warnke was too liberal, so he, he voted against one of the positions and supported the other position. Senator Nunn was not in favor of the SALT II Treaty unless we increased defense spending. As it turned out, the Soviets invaded Afghanistan, so it became a moot point. Right. So how would you describe, uh, as, as if there is an average day in, in, in Congress, what, what was an average day at work like well, for, uh, for Arnold Pernaro? So there's a huge difference between the personal staff and the committee sure. staff. So an average day on the personal staff, you are consumed with answering the mail and answering constituent phone calls, constituent visits. As an intern, I took people on tours of the Capitol. Mm -hmm. and took them to all the places, the Lincoln Catafalque, which is below the dome, which very few tourists see, where they keep the, the catafalque that Lincoln's body was laid on. And when people lie in state in the Capitol, they bring it up to the rotunda. A um, lot of, it, of paperwork and administrative stuff. But, but as I, I shifted out of the intern to being the assistant press secretary, obviously we were always answering questions from the press. Right. Um, we had a, a weekly radio and TV show that we got out to the, the media back in Georgia. Roland and I would travel and visit the news media sites in Georgia. We traveled with Senator Nunn on the weekends, um, you know, when he went back to Georgia. Um, I remember one of the first trips I made with, with Senator Nunn, you know, he'd do like five uh, events a day on a Saturday. And we're on a Saturday afternoon, we're in this guy's house in Atlanta. And, and Roland wants to know how things going. And I said, Roland, you're not gonna believe it. We're, we're, we're with some guy and he, he looks to me like he's kind of a little nutty, you know? <laughs> Roland said, well, who is it? I said, well, his name is Ted Turner. I don't know much about him. Anyway, long story short, of course, it was Ted Turner of CNN fame and uh, who became the, the sponsor of the Nuclear Threat Initiative. So obviously I was wrong, he was not nutty at all. Well, um, uh... <laughs> But in any event, in any event, um, you had long days in the Senate because uh, the staff would have to get in fairly early. The Senate didn't really crank up till 9.30 or 10. <laughs> and then it was very unpredictable, so they would work late into the evenings because you always had to be there in case there were votes. Right. But I mean, you, you, had, you had constituent uh, requirements, casework, letters to answer, meetings to, to host, 
Um, personal staff um, basically was very hectic. On the committee staff, it's a little bit more balanced. And one, you're not dealing with the constituents. Okay. Two, you're running hearings. Three, you're passing legislation. So it's a it's just a different level. I mean, certainly the work days were still very long. I mean, we'd come in around seven. We wouldn't leave till seven at night. And once you got into markup season, you were working six and a half days a week until you got to the August recess. So how much interaction is there between committee staff and personal staff? Well, we had a lot in the Dunn operation because I had come from the personal staff, so I knew everybody over there. So, you know, look, our job was to support Senator Nunn, and, and we understood that he had uh, priorities that had to be dealt with, including defense interests in Georgia. And when they came up, they'd come over and meet with us on the committee. So we had a lot of, and I was lucky uh, that Nunn's administrative or chiefs of staff were people that I'd worked with, Roland, Charlie Harmon, Bob Hurd. So we got along really well. We also did not want to have press people on the Armed Services Committee staff, so I, I kept I asked Senator Nunn to keep the press people over in the Nunn personal staff, so they handle all that for us. Interesting. So I should have asked this earlier, but how would you describe um, how would you describe Senator Nunn and his political style? Would Would you say he's a natural politician, or 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 is he? Well, what's his individual political style like? Well, I mean, um, or st I, style generally, I should say, I mean, as Senator a boss, was, as a was a was a serious United States senator. I mean, he 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 did his homework. He prepared for everything. He was very diligent. Um, he was very attentive uh, to the back home as well as the the big picture issues. Um, you know, he was he was considered a workhorse, not a show horse. Um, he got called. I mean, we, we, unlike most senators, we didn't have to call Face the Nation or Meet the Press. They were always calling him. Um, and, um, you know, he was, a, he was considered an icon of the Senate. Um, so what was it like, you know, you described, especially the personal staff and the, the time commitment and the hectic work schedules. What was it like trying to juggle your home life, personal life, with the life of a senior senator. Well, I was staffer. very fortunate. My, my wife, Jan, had a better job than I had. She worked at the International <laughs> Trade Commission. She was at the time a GS-14. But when our first son, Joe, was born, she, we decided she would stay home with the kids. And so I was very lucky. She was not working. Um, obviously, it was kind of a struggle. With, we had four kids on a, a, a government salary. The government salaries uh, weren't that high. Um, but I was very fortunate because um, she basically had the lion's share of the of the of the work with with the family, and I and you know one of the things that um, you know I didn't get to as many soccer games and basketball games as I should have. Um, I'm not making that mistake with my ten grandkids. <laughs> so. I want to want to focus on on that work you did with the with the Senate staff. You know, when you were in the the minority, which would have been eighty one to, to eighty seven, January eighty one to eighty seven. How did that work? Did 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 Senator Nunn take marching orders from the the chairman, or or so how, we did, how does that work? The Senate Armed Services Committee has been very. It was very bipartisan under Senator Stennis and John Tower. Right. It was very bipartisan under Barry Goldwater and Sam Nunn. We were equal partners, okay. and they admired Senator Nunn. They needed Senator Nunn. They needed his votes. They needed the fact that he could bring the Democratic caucus along. Mm -hmm. um, so we, and today the Senate Armed Services Committee still operates in a bipartisan fashion. One of the hallmarks of that committee, and so as the minority staff director, you don't set the agenda, but we were full participants in everything that went on. It was, it was a pleasure. And actually, I, I, it was really 83 to 87. Uh, I learned a lot, and I think I actually benefited by being the minority staff director before becoming the staff director. Why do you say that? Well, I kind of learned how the committee worked. I come from the personal staff. So I had not been on the So you weren't, staff. you weren't thrown into, you were able to you know, take we that. We didn't run the committee. You right. Know, we basically. You were able to observe. Observe and everything. And then okay. when Senator Nunn became uh, chair, we put together a, a set of briefing papers and books about this thick on things he ought to look at is because you set the agenda, you set the framework. We started with hearings on strategy instead of starting with hearings on the budget. Senator Nunn was always a big blue arrow person, big picture strategic thinker. Um, 
But you know, we had we had some tough issues when Reagan was president. Yeah. Um, if it hadn't been for Senator Nunn, the sale of AWACS to Saudi Arabia, which was so essential in the first Gulf War, wouldn't have gone through. Um, so he was he was a a key vote, um, you know, in any administration. You know, I don't know if Senator Nunn's it's a bunch of books have been written about Senator Nunn. Sure. Uh, I didn't address this in in my first book, but maybe some have. Just about every president asked Senator Nunn to be Secretary of Defense. Many, many people don't know that. One of the things that, when the Tower, John Tower was nominated to be Secretary of Defense, um, and you know, mainly because of some issues that came up with his personal behavior, right. he ultimately was not confirmed by the Senate. And some people say, well, that was because Senator Nunn wanted to be Secretary of Defense. Actually, they'd asked Senator Bush had asked Senator Nunn before he asked Tower, <laughs> and he turned it down. So. That was just not accurate. So w one of the really important um, issues that came before the committee that sort of bridges that time, 86, 87, minority to majority, is, is the Packard Commission. Right. And then the subsequent legislation that comes out of the Packard Commission. Were you involved in that, that yes. blue... blue I, I, yeah, I, I was very involved in that. In fact, uh, the people, Rhett Dawson, uh -huh. who had been the staff director for John Tower, was, was the staff director of the Packard Commission, somebody I knew really well and is actually a close personal friend of mine. We do stuff together even now. Ken Creek, who ultimately became the Undersecretary for Acquisition and Technology and Logistics, was on the staff. And David Berteau, who right now runs the Professional Services Commission, was on the staff. Dave Packard would come up and meet with Senator Nunn on a frequent basis. Bob Barrow, the former Commandant of the Marine Corps, who actually had promoted me to first lieutenant at Camp Butler and promoted me to major when he was commandant. So I had a relationship with General Barrow, um, who was on it as well. So we were very involved with the Packard Commission and in fact, uh, got Dave Packard to help us get win the vote to create the vice chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. We got their Packard Commission to recommend that. We only won it by one vote in the Senate. Wow. And thank goodness the Packard Commission also helped recommend it. So we, 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 Sir Nunn was a big supporter of the Packard Commission recommendation. So the, Dave Packard of, of Hewlett Packard. Um, Correct. What, what was the impetus behind this commission? Why, why 1986? Well, the, the basic, basically, you had the situation uh, with Ronald Reagan and Cap Weinberger as Secretary of Defense. Mm -hmm. uh, we were spending these huge sums of money and we were not getting the bank for the buck we should for the dollars we were spending and that was recognized in the White House by Bud McFarlane, who was the National Security Advisor, Mike Donnelly, who was his deputy. Mike, who would go, who'd worked on the committee staff with us. Bud McFarlane, who'd been on the staff with me. He and I were the two principal investigators of Desert One when that fiasco happened oh. in the Carter administration. So we were talking to them about the fact that we're not getting the bang for buck we should because the DOD acquisition system is so uh, broken. And so they brought in, Weinberger opposed it, the Secretary of Defense opposed it, but it was created by Ronald Reagan in the White House to basically come in and recommend reforms to the acquisition process, which they did, and we passed them. So it, the, the legislation, was that uh, Goldwater-Nichols that came no, out of that? No, it was not. Goldwater-Nichols okay. was about the operational arrangements of the U.S. military. Right, reorganization. So, so that was strengthen civilian control of the military, strengthen the role of the civilian Secretary of Defense, strengthen the combatant commanders, the war fighting commanders, make the chain of command very crystal clear. Packard was passed the same year, but it was not part of Goldwater Nichols. Okay. Goldwater Nichols focused on the operational chain of command. Packard was focused on the management chain of command. So this, this you know, 86, 80, this must get all, all get lost. We also, we also passed the creation of the special operations legislation that same year as well, oh. over the objection of the Pentagon. So. The, the three major reforms of the Pentagon in that time frame were all passed over the objection of the Pentagon leadership. Goldwater, Nichols, Packard, and Special Operations. All during the Reagan presidency of... Uh, if it was 86, if yeah. he was still president, yeah. 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 And he signed all the legislation, by the way. So I wanted to take a step back. You mentioned Desert One. I had no idea you were involved in investigating yeah. the... So De Desert One, the the failed slash aborted rescue right. attempt of the of the Iranian hostages. Um, was that investigation done in um, the Armed Services it Committee? It was. It was done in the Senate Armed Services Committee, but because Jim Vaught, who was the commanding general of the 24th Mech Division at Fort Stewart, was somebody I knew really well, mm -hmm. 
and he'd been the overall commander. And also there were a bunch of Georgians there. Um, uh, Senator Nunn was very involved in it, so he had me staff it for him. And Bud McFarland was the lead for the Senate Armed Services Committee. Uh, former a Marine, retired as a Lieutenant Colonel. How much for John Tower? How much access were you, were you granted to to the Pentagon officials and White all, House? We had access to everything. We had all the people that flew the missions. We we had Charlie Beckwith. We had General Vaught. We had access to everything. We had access to the cables. We had we had everything. And what what, what were the conclusions of the the committee? The conclusions were General Vaught. Um, was too secretive in the way that he planned it and operated it. He never trained jointly, and um, they picked some of the wrong equipment. The helicopters they used were not capable of flying in sand and things like that. And then they just had some bad luck at the, at the site in the desert. So, so poor planning met bad luck and and and, and, and poor equipment. Right. So and, you and and again, you know. The leadership, the leadership, Jim Vaught was just the wrong leader. Right. So it's just a a, a, a confluence of yeah. poor poor decision making and, and everything. So we've got looks like it's about three forty. You still good on time? Yeah. Go okay. Ahead. Okay. So when you get into the you, when Senator Nunn becomes chair, what does that mean for for you and how your job? Changes. Well, we're totally in charge at that point. Okay. You, you basically make all the decisions. You're the majority. You've either got the votes or you don't. Obviously, John Warner was his partner. We worked with them in sure. a cooperative way, a total bipartisan way. But you have to run the trains on time. You have. <laughs> we had more hearings than any other committee. We had more nominations than any other committee. We reported the largest piece of legislation out. Uh, you know, you had to travel. You know, you had four stars and. You know, everybody and their brother. Senator Nunn had developed relationships with the German defense ministers and the, and the, the parliamentary body of NATO over the years, mm -hmm. big supporter of NATO. So the demands on his time were just exceptional. Right. So, you know, you mentioned Senator Russell at the very beginning. And one thing that Senator Russell did was travel around to, right. to, to bases in Europe and elsewhere. Was that some, was that a part of your job? Yes, we did that. We, because you, you, you know, as a, as a, and of course, I I gotten back in the Marine Corps Reserves in '74, and that was because uh, when he he was a commander in, in in Vietnam and became the chief of staff of the Army. Craig Abrams, legendary Army chief of staff, legendary Army soldier, um, he came to visit Senator Nunn in like '73 or '74, and because I was the only one on Nunn's staff at the time that had been in Vietnam, I was invited to sit in on the meeting. And um, Abrams uh, uh, talked to me after the meeting in the hall. He said, well, you know, I hear you, you served in Vietnam. Tell me a little bit about your Vietnam service. Then he said, did you stay in the reserves? I said, no, I didn't stay in the reserves. I said, my understanding is the reserves aren't worth much. He <laughs> says, oh, Arnold, that's going to change. We're never going to go to war again without calling up the Guard Reserve. You should join the reserve. So I actually joined the Marine Corps Reserve because of Army General Craig Nabums, and I actually met his sons, John Abrams and Abe Abrams, years later, both through armed services, but then afterwards, and thanked both of them, because if it hadn't been for their dad, I would have never gotten in the reserve. So I was actually in the reserves at the same time I was, you know, working on the staff. Plus, that gave me access to know what was really going on behind the scenes, which other staffers didn't have. But we did trap, and, and what you learn as a leader in the, in the military, if you don't get out and kick the tires and find out what's going on out in the field, you're not going to know what's going on. Right. So, what sort of prior now? Now you you'd mentioned how by, there was a bar, bipartisan uh, workmanship on the on the committee, but did Senator Nunn have certain priorities that he wanted to to make a reality when he became yeah, yes. chair? I mean, he, first of all, you had to pass the annual defense authorization bill so that you could fund and authorize. Everything in the Department of Defense, from weapon systems to personnel levels mm -hmm. to bonus pay and bonuses to health care, um, but yeah, he had he had things that we would sit down each year and what are the things for this year? What do we need to accomplish this year? I mean, I remember when the when the Cold War was ending, we we had gone through the drawdown in Vietnam, and it was a big mistake the way we drew down Vietnam, and we all decided, Sir Nunn decided, we're not going to repeat that. Let's make sure we don't break the force when we draw it down in the end of the Cold War. 
So we put in all kind of provisions to keep from breaking the force and protecting the career, career force. And then because there were people that were gonna to need to get out early, we, we, we authorized a 15 year retirement. We had programs, troops to teachers, troops to cops, a lot of things to basically protect the force that we didn't do in the drawdown after Vietnam, hmm. which took us years and years to recover from. So, so he, would, he would have various priorities that he'd want to accomplish each year. You mentioned a uh, relationship with NATO. Um, was, it, was it beneficial to you that Senator Mattingly moved over to NATO after? Yeah, big, after? big time. Yeah, absolutely. So what sort of relationship would, would a, a Senate, Senate Armed Services chairman have with NATO, which is... Well, uh, so, so Senator Nunn, early in his Senate career, got involved with the Center for Strategic and International Studies, CSIS. It was then run by Georgetown, it's not now. Although it's run by our former staffer, John Hamry, that I hired in 87 to come uh, work on the committee, and then he went to the Pentagon. Then he ran CSIS when Senator Nunn was chairman for decades. Um, but Simon Lund, who was a, a, part of, a, a staffer with the NATO Assembly, the North Atlantic Assembly, which is the parliamentary bottle of NATO, he came over and met with us in the early 70s, got Senator Nunn really interested in NATO. And so Senator Nunn started becoming active in the North Atlantic Assembly, and he met a lot of the junior members of parliament like himself, such as Manfred Werner from Germany. Manfred Werner went on to become the defense minister and ultimately the secretary general of NATO. Mm. This is someone Senator Nunn had known for 20 years. Right. So he developed those relationships and of course, was a huge supporter of NATO. Again, our first report, NATO and the New Soviet Threat, Steve Rosenfeld from the Washington Post wrote an article, Sam Nunn has saved NATO. Because, and I, the other funny thing is, I remember getting a, a letter or a postcard from a Georgian, how do you grow one of those NATOs? He thought it was a vegetable. So, so you know, we had, we had to educate Jordans on the, Georgians on the part of the NATO. <laughs> the other one that I remember about Senator Nunn is, of course, Senator Nunn, like I, had a southern accent. And he, he would mispronounce the word nuclear sometimes, and he'd go, nuclear, nuclear, nuclear threat. And a teacher in Georgia wrote him a letter and said, Senator Nunn, a nuclear is a shellfish. You are trying to say the words nuclear. So we, <laughs> we got that. <laughs> but he, he had great, Senator Nunn had great, he was a networker before networking was pop, right. popular. So, and he treated everybody with dignity and respect, including the military, so that, that goes a long way. Right. You have more friends with, uh, or what is it, more, more flies right. with honey. So, 1989, 1992 is a really critical period right. for U.S. You know, foreign policy, I mean, global um, the, 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 the geopolitical situation with the, with the crumbling and collapse of the right. Soviet Union. How did the Senate Armed Services Committee respond to the pretty quick collapse and fall well, of the I, Soviet Union? Well, first of all, Senator Nunn had great personal relationship with Brendan Groskopf, George Bush, uh, Cheney, Colin Powell, all the people that were in charge, Jim Baker, George Shultz, and of course he and George Shultz and Kissinger and Bill Perry mm -hmm. became famous friends later in life. So he was very involved in all that, and, and we basically had some um, viewpoints about, again, how do, you, how do you, you know, draw down from the Cold War without breaking the force and making sure that you're postured for the future. So that's what we kept our focus on. Now, you, um, Desert Shield, Desert Storm, something you, right. you'd mentioned with the AWACS. Now, were you mobilized during? Yeah, I was. So, so, I, I so yeah, how, how did that work? <laughs> well, so uh, Al Gray, so Senator Nunn decided to have hearings about the, the Gulf, possible Gulf War. Um, and Cheney, Powell, Jim Schlesinger, everybody was anybody. But he had the senior military people telling him behind the scenes, Colin Powell, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, Schwarzkopf, who we met as a one star that was the commander of Central Command, Al Gray, Sir Nunn, we don't want to go to war over there. It's going to be really, really bad. So he had the military whispering in his ear. Uh, Al Gray, then Commandant, who I had a, a relationship with as well, uh, decided to mobilize me so I could go over there and learn firsthand what was going on on the ground. 
Uh, I didn't know it at the time. I thought I was just getting mobilized as a reservist um, and got over there and ended up going to the first three divisions that I knew well and knew Mike Myatt and Tom Drowdy, who were the, the division commander, assistant division commander. Uh, Ron Richard was the G3 of the second Marine division. Bill Keyes was the commander of the second Marine division. Uh, Jerry Humble was the three of the first Marine division. So I really got a firsthand view of everything and the real intel of what was going on. And so that was, I think, very helpful to Senator Nunn. He so, will tell you so you were able to communicate with Senator Nunn while yeah. you were mobile. I, I, I assume well, he had the clearance. Well, not really, but I was able to, to, to get back and, and fill him in. I see. Senator Nunn will admit to this day that one of the only mistakes he ever made was voting against the Gulf War when his resolution went down. We all recommended that he voted for it. I certainly recommended that he voted for it. Um, if he could get that vote back, that's probably one he would change. Right. <laughs> so, um, I, my mo my mom uh, in high school, well, when she was in high school, my, my grandfather served on Strategic Air Command base. SAC went away, after, what was that, 1992? I don't oh. know when SAC went away, but I will tell you, we were huge fans of SAC. We went to SAC every year. They had the best intel on what the Russians were doing and what the Russians were doing. We flew out to Omaha every single year to meet with the SAC commander. Was that Offutt? Offutt Air Force Base yeah. in the dead of winter. It was cold oh, as heck gosh. out there. Although you'd get a pretty good steak in the old club. Um, <laughs> and we would get the intel briefing and get the, the Senator Nunn was one of the few people, in fact, maybe the only person in the legislative branch, including myself, that got read in on the, what, the PSYOP, the Single Integrated Operational Plan which was basically the nuclear laydown for, for in case we had to go to war, nuclear war with Russia or other people. So what, what all did that involve? Like which, which missiles would launch where? And uh, We were read in on the PSYOP. We knew everything that was going to happen. That was sobering, I'm sure. Pretty sobering, yeah. <laughs> that's, why you, that's why you put a lot of emphasis on. Yeah. He was a big supporter of the MX, the V2 deterrence. Mm -hmm. Ma massive retaliation. You, you know, don't strike us because if you strike us, you you, you won't exist anymore. Have you? And this is jumping ahead a bit in, in talking about current events. But have you been surprised at the 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 events in in Eastern Europe with Ukraine and Russia, or is this sort of a pattern that that of well, be, I mean, behavior Putin, that Putin yeah. is always? I mean, Senator Nunn was never a big champion of NATO expansion. He thought it would be too threatening to Russia. So he was not one of the ones that would have been pell-mell, let's add all these countries to NATO. Um, and Russia's Putin, of course, wants to push the boundaries back out. And um, I think there were things we could have done to deter him from attacking Ukraine. But now that he's attacked it, we've got to, we've got to basically defeat him. So do you think that, that I was reading New York Times, and, and my father-in-law, full disclosure, works in, in defense, the defense industries. Um, do you, I, in the New York Times was talking about how the Western powers, mainly United States and the United Kingdom, have sent so much material to Ukraine that it's now, they need a massive buildup of armaments uh, because well, of how much. To, we're going to have to reconstitute our stockpiles. I mean, I've got an op-ed that hopefully I'll get published in the next week or so. The fact is, we weren't buying enough munitions in the U.S. military to support our own war plans, much less support Ukraine. And you know, we we they've used more uh, rounds in Ukraine than we basically buy an entire year in the Department of Defense. So that that's one that has to be. And uh, we're talking primarily artillery rounds. Well, smart bombs, artillery, not you know, not just one type of munition. Right. Um, and if you go look at Freedom Sport in World War II and what we were able to do in World War II, we, we, at, the, at the end of the Cold War, one of the mistakes we made in the Department of Defense was consolidating our industry. And so we necked it down because, the, you know, just like in the commercial side, just in time, having stuff ready just in time, that doesn't work well in wartime. So we're going to have to reconstitute and rebuild our defense industrial base and build capacity and second sources and things of that nature. Just a quick follow-up to that. I know this is sort of more far afield from the, the, the Senate staff, but you know, we point to World War II. Industrial capacity far exceeded 
what we have now because of outsourcing and globalization. Is that something that has been problematic for the, the defense industry, the, the munitions industry? Or is that something we still have a, a core of here in the United no, States? No, it's, it's problematic. I mean, for example, or at least components being sourced. Stockpile, which used to have hundreds of billions of dollars now is, you know, way low. Um, we don't have a capacity, the surge capacity. Look at what the head of Raytheon said. It's going to be two years before we can basically increase the production of certain of these smart weapons that we need. So we, we do not have the industrial capacity that we need. That's one of the reasons that they're talking about onshoring. Mm -hmm. For example, antimony, which is one of the, the, the critical minerals used in the propellant, for many of these munitions, the primary source is China and Russia. That's so problematic. We, 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 China right now can, has one shipyard that can build 11 surface combatants in a year, which is more than all five of our five for profit yards can do. So they've got excessive manufacturing capability vis a vis us right now. So, one topic um, of policy, not necessarily legislation, that we didn't talk about was. Don't ask, don't tell. In about 1993, 94, after after President Clinton takes office, what had the policy been, and, and what was Senator Nunn's role in the Senate Armed Services Committee's role in, in in rolling out that policy? Well, the um, the longstanding uh, policy in the Department of Defense um, during the period of time I served, and all the years I served in the reserves, and up until Clinton was elected president was that um, gays and homosexuals could not serve openly in the US military and um, that um, if you verbalized anything or said that that was the equivalent of serving openly so during the campaign uh, candidate Clinton talked about changing that policy and uh, when he met with Les Aspen and Senator Nunn who were his defense advisors, and I was in that meeting with Ray, Rudy De Leon up in New York. Senator Nunn asked me to brief then candidate Clinton about you know what it's like to serve in the military, particularly in a small infantry unit, <coughs> and why he, Senator Nunn, didn't think that, that it was time to change that policy, that military wasn't ready for it, which absolutely proved to be the case. Um, and he thought it was gonna hurt Clinton in the South, but Clinton didn't, he downplayed it, didn't make a big deal out of it. Um, what happened was Les Aspen went on Face the Nation like a week after the president was elected and said, we're gonna change it. And that just created a huge firestorm. Uh, the Republicans in the Senate basically said they were gonna come out all out against it. The president wanted to pass by the end of January the Family Medical and Leave Act. So the Republicans were gonna basically put an amendment, which you can do in the Senate on that to basically block Clinton. So Senator Nunn uh, recommended um, with George Mitchell, who was the majority leader, that they kind of walk away from it, which he did not want to do. So they worked out an agreement where uh, Senator Nunn convinced the Republicans to not offer any amendments and that we would hold hearings in the Armed Services Committee and then make a recommendation, which is what we did. Um, uh, at the time, um, Mitchell, the majority Democratic majority leader, uh, indicated to Clinton that he didn't think there were 30 votes in the Senate to basically change the policy of 100 senators. Certainly, we didn't have the votes in the Senate Armed Services Committee, and half of the people on the Democratic side didn't support what Clinton wanted to do. So it wasn't just Senator Nunn as chairman. So what we, so the agreement was that uh, we would maintain uh, the status quo meaning nothing would change during the period of time when we had the hearings, mm -hmm. and then we would make a recommendation um, at, based on the hearings. And you know, so we had to set up a set of, of objective hearings to make sure we heard both sides um, of it. And you know, we went out in the field and did hearings on submarines. We did hearings on ships. You know, we had testimony from people in the field, things like that. So. And, and uh, ultimately um, came up with the, the policy called Don't Ask, Don't Tell, which is as long as, um, um, you know, the, what, what had happened is when you were signing up to be a recruit, you had to say, you had to sign the document and say whether or not you were homosexual. And so 
Um, and if you if you said if you are and you signed that you weren't, then you were lying on your recruiting document. Right. So the don't ask, don't tell basically was you weren't going to get asked and you weren't going to say. Right. And and um, that was ultimately passed into law. It had a series of findings. It it uphold uh, all the we, we wrote the findings in a way that it would sustain any Supreme Court review, mm -hmm. and it never got turned over in the courts until Obama came in. And, and at the time. At the time, the senior military and the junior military were not ready for a change. When Obama became president, it had changed. And so Senator Nunn and I both supported the changes that Obama made. But right. I think at the time, uh, the military was not ready for that change. And that was very clear. And again, there weren't even the votes in the, in the Senate Armed Services Committee. Let alone the, Let alone the, the, the Senate at large. Or, or, or the House, for that yeah. matter. So, you know, thinking back, Senator Nunn only really faced real opposition in 1972 when he was when he was running for the Senate. Why do you think he never really faced significant opposition? Well, in I, think, I think that's because um, he was very diligent in, in going back to Georgia and, and keeping his ears to the ground, basically taking care of his constituents, but also uh, uh, supporting policies that were in, in tune with the majority of Georgians. Um, and so um, and he operated in a bipartisan fashion, and he was a very conservative Southern Democrat, and so he was more conservative than a lot of the Republican conservatives, and so I think that was a, that was Georgia at the time. Right. So, were you involved in conversations leading up to 1996 when he eventually decided against offering for re-election? I was, yeah, and I also was involved when. He, at one point, he was thinking about should he run for president, and he just basically said he didn't have the fire in the belly, and he thought there were other people that could do the job just as well. And that was for both cases. It was yeah. just mm -hmm. he decided mm -hmm. it was. He, I mean, he felt. I mean, he would certainly could have gotten reelected in a heartbeat, but he felt like he'd done all what he wanted to do in the Senate, and we were kind of doing some things over and over again that we'd already done. Like you were, they they. What had happened is you got to what we call these walk to plank votes where you're just voting on things that you know have no chance of passing, but people want you to get your position so they can use it against you in a campaign ad. Not that it ever bothered Senator Nunn. And he just wanted to, you know, work on like the nuclear proliferation initiative, try to, uh, the Nunn-Luger thing. Uh, uh, he, he took over as chairman of the Center for Strategic and International Studies. He went on a but bunch of corporate boards including the General Electric Company and he did a lot of business things so um, he had he didn't lobby he didn't lobby and so uh, he had extremely productive post Senate career for sure do you agree with it with Roland the title of Roland's book that, that Senator Nunn was the best president we never had I think that's a great title yeah I mean <laughs> he would have been a great president um, um, he, he just never felt like that that was his unique calling, and and um, you know he he was, I mean the influence that he had was quite pronounced. I mean they, Senator Nunn, along with Richard Russell, probably the most powerful chairman of the Senate Armed Services Committee they've ever had, and certainly I would say, and I'm not being parochial, uh, I, I admire and respect the chairmen that have come since him. They not even close to having the power he had. He just commanded. I mean, George Bush sent him to Pakistan to talk to Zio Hawk about whether or not we ought to give stingers to knock the Soviets out of Afghanistan, which we did. Jimmy Carter sent him to meet with Deng Xiaoping in China to open the door to China. I mean, uh, Carter sent him to stop a war in Haiti. I mean, that's that, you know, that, that. Uh, so you, you, mentioned, you mentioned the stingers and, and Pakistan. I saw a movie, and I remember it called, being called Charlie Wilson's War, yeah. not, not Sam Nunn's War. Or what, what? What relationship did he have? Well, did, so I, I would say so. I would say I, I'm I'm very amused when everybody you know all the publicity that Charlie Wilson got. Of course, <laughs> he was into publicity, just like he was into escorting you know blonde bombshells around town. Um, Leo Hazelwood was the was the comptroller of the CIA at the time. Leo came to me every year, in, in now unclassified but then classified for 250 million dollars to support the war in Afghanistan, which none supported. We funded the war in Afghanistan, not Charlie Wilson. So, and we also, Sir Nunn was a huge supporter 
of the, of the Mujahideen. Uh, we met with the Mujahideen when we traveled over to Pakistan. We went up to the Khyber Pass and met with the Khyber Rifles. So basically it was defense dollars that, su that did the co support of the covert action. Well, and Leo would, would back this up because he ended up retiring and working at the same company with me at SAIC. <laughs> well, I'm glad I, you know, I'm thinking. So Charlie Wilson gets all the credit, but so, but we did the we did the real work. Well, now now you know from from now on, I'm just going to sit sit here and play over my head. Who who would play Sam Nunn in a, in a movie if Tom Hanks was playing Charlie Wilson? Yeah. Although I think Tom Hanks was a little upgrade from the real Charlie Wilson. But, but I mean, I remember I remember because we we met with the Mujahideen, and I remember Senator Nunn when we went back and met with George Bush. He said, uh, Mr. Mr. President, you got to remember. These are not, they're not fighting for Jeffersonian democracy. They're fighting for their country. It was the Taliban at the time, by the way. So, did you ever reflect on that in, in your year? Because you were mobilized post 9 11 and well, with I, I Afghanistan. Think I wrote about it in my first you did. Book. Yeah. You did. So, you know, the thinking back on this, and you were talking about uh, how Senator Nunn was offered. Secretary of, uh, of Defense, uh, he had thought about running for president. How, how seriously should we have taken the chatter in 2008 that he was going to be picked as Barack Obama's vice, vice presidential running mate? You know, I, I don't have a good feel for that yeah. um, because, you know, obviously we've both been out of the Senate for a long time yeah. and, um, um, you know, um, that's a question I, I, for the I senator. I would have thought it was not. I, I would have thought that they were they were spouting that to basically try to show up sort of their southern flank, but it was never a serious consideration. Senator Nunn was too conservative for Barack Obama and the Democratic Party. Yeah, sh certainly by two thousand eight. And, and I mean, he was not you know uh, uh, a big pro union person, um, although he had great relationship with Coretta Scott King. Martin Luther King, uh, Marty Jr. worked in our office for a while, but I mean, oh. he, he uh, I, I don't think they were looking to shore up the South. Right. So the last, you know, five, six, seven years, and, and as somebody who works in government and the periphery of government, uh, had been pretty chaotic um, in terms of, especially yeah. here in Washington. Um, you know, as somebody who, who had experience in, in Washington, what was, what was your feeling uh, you know, watching the January 6th events unfold at the Capitol in a place that you, you had worked for, for so many years. Well, I mean, the, 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 the thing that, that upset me the most was having been in combat with young Marines that were killed to basically protect our democracy, and you had these Trump people, and it was clearly pushed by Donald Trump, that were basically trying to overthrow our country. It was a coup. I mean, every one of them should have been tried for treason and, and, and gotten the death penalty because that's what you do with treasonous people. What could and, have... and everybody that fought in every war our country's ever had died for this country and, they, and they, uh, it's a stain on our democracy that will never be erased. What could have been done to, to one, prevent it from happening in the first place? Well, I, and... think, I think better uh, acting on, on intelligence sooner but I think, the mili I think the military and the law enforcement should have used force. Deadly force. Well, is, is, there, is there any other kind of force? Not, not I mean, that. When they're trying to situation. kill you, I mean, you know, I speak, you know, people, I, I say a little bit tongue in cheek, you know, the first job my country gave me, they sent me to a place where people tried to kill me and they almost did. So if somebody's trying to kill you, you have to use deadly force back. They were trying to kill the law enforcement people. so. Do you think the, and I think I know the answer to this already, but do you think there's been enough done to deter something like that from happening? No, again? I don't. No, I don't. I think, the, I think the militia groups in this country are out of control. I don't think our law enforcement's on top of it. I don't think our intelligence forces are on top of it. I don't think people really understand the depth of the, of the militia movement in this country. Which was something that, that I remember in, in the 90s, that, that being a real focus of, of the FBI and domestic intelligence. And, and, and they don't understand the ability of a person like Donald Trump to, to foment hate and dissension. I mean, you know, it, it, uh, 
it's not like uh, you're the colonel and you're in Iwo Jima and say charge that hill and all the young corporals charge the hill because they're in the military. Um, Donald Trump incited uh, this insurrection and this coup against the United States of America. Do you think anything will come of the January 6th committee's recommendations? Legislatively, no, because the Republicans will take back the House. They're not going to pass anything that looks like it's critical of what happened on January 6th. So I think it's all going to be through the judicial system. Maybe, maybe down the road uh, it might pass, but I, I, I'm not real optimistic that legislative fixes will pass. You know, some some would say the 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 job of working in the government is is not as not nearly as attractive as it once was. Would you still recommend to young people, or not maybe not so young people, that they should still get uh, become active and, and and work in government, become a staffer in the House or the Senate, like you did? Well, so um, I'm actually the third book I'm working on now is about the Senate confirmation process called yeah. If Confirmed. And one of the reasons I want to write it is I want to give people an incentive to come in government. We need better people to come in government. Yes, I would still encourage people to go in government. There's no better calling than, than working in your government. No higher calling. Well, General Pernaro, this, is, this has been a, a very um, eye-opening and, and, and thought-provoking conversation. I really do appreciate it. Sure. We'll, we'll have to sit down another time to talk about okay. your, your extensive career outside of government service. Um, we can do that in Athens next time the, the Bulldogs are playing or, or something like that. Yeah, happy to do it anytime. All right. Well, thank you very okay, much, sir. Thanks. Go Great. dogs. Great to be with you.